Come on now. Off right on time. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to see each of you. I, uh, from many of you, I've known for a long time, but haven't seen you now for uh, a long time. So it's great to see you back in the room. Let me uh, begin by offering my thanks on behalf of uh, our caucus and all Manitobans for the service of Brian Pallister, who resigned as Premier officially this morning. Uh, for three decades, Mr. Pallister has served in challenging roles provincially uh, and in Canada. The challenges have never been greater than they've been over the last 18 months, and I know that it's taken a toll on his family. I saw that personally. I've uh, been in the legislature for some time now in uh, different roles and when uh, Premier Gary Filman and Premier Gary Dewar and Premier Greg Selinger left office, left the office of Premier, uh, I was able to speak with them and to offer my thanks for their service uh, as Premier, regardless of parties and regardless of politics, regardless of policies and decisions, it is a hard job. And for Brian and Esther Pallister and their family, we wish them all the best, and I hope that they have more time for each other, for their uh, extended families, and for their hobbies and interests. Uh, this morning, I had the honor of being sworn in uh, as Manitoba's Premier. My wife Kim and my son Malachi were able to attend a small private event at a Government House and I want to as always thank them so much for their support. While I am honoured to take on this position even for a relatively short period of time, uh, the greatest role that I will ever have is that of a husband and a father. My father, uh, who was an alcoholic, died at the age of 33 years old from his addiction. I was just 11 years old at the time. My uh, mom was left to raise my sister and I as a single mother. We were fortunate to be able to live in government housing uh, after the years that my father had passed away and I'm grateful that those supports, those public supports were there for us. It was very special for me to have my mom uh, this morning at the swearing-in at Government House. She's a testament to caring and self-sacrifice. Uh, I'm also grateful to her honour, uh, Janice Filman, for pres presiding over the ceremony and making my family feel uh, at home uh, in her home uh, because I know it was a little bit intimidating uh, for them to be there. My uh, time uh, in the Manitoba Legislature uh, began as an intern. I was honoured to spend uh, many days in this building writing speeches and photocopying papers and every day in this role, regardless of the role you have, uh, it's an honour. It's an incredible honour to be in the Manitoba Legislature and when you're here you always rely on those experiences that you've had in the past. I spoke about um, the difficulty that my family had when my father passed away uh, at a young age um, and it shapes you. It caused me to be part of opening uh, the first food bank in Steinbach and being its vice president because I thought it was an important way to help those who needed help as others helped my family when we needed help. I know that the role that I have uh, is primarily viewed as one of caretaker. A new Premier will be selected uh, for Manitobans in 60 days. But I also know that uh, these are times that will still require significant decisions. And I will rely upon the, my PC caucus colleagues, a great team of women and men, to assist in these decisions. As it is a caretaker role, Cabinet will continue on in its current composition for a new Premier to make longer term decisions decisions about uh, the cabinet when they assume office. However, at this point, uh, I have asked my friend and colleague, Minister Rochelle Squires, to serve as the Deputy Premier, and I'm honoured that she has accepted that offer. 
After cabinet this morning, I began the process of uh, reaching out and listening. I had a few calls uh, that I was able to make and others have been arranged. Uh, and I appreciated the opportunity to speak with uh, Grand Chief uh, Arlen Dumas this morning and uh, his kind words and personal expressions uh, were meaningful to me. Uh, Cam Blight, the President of the Association of Manitoba Municipalities. I spoke with uh, Wab Canoe uh, as well. Uh, we had a very uh, a nice conversation. We are political adversaries, but we are not political enemies. Uh, and I appreciated some of his perspective in speaking to him this morning. Uh, there are many other calls that are uh, being set up, and I look forward to uh, speaking to Mayor Brian Bowman uh, this afternoon, inviting him to the Premier's office uh, to have a discussion about the priorities that he has as well. Over the next uh, two months that I have the honour of serving in this role, I look forward to reaching out to as many people as I can to opening up the Premier's office and to hearing people's views and ideas. I have no doubt that when I open those doors to many different groups and organizations in the time that I have, uh, some will have uh, constructive criticism, some will have good ideas, uh, some will have uh, complaints, uh, and some will have a strong vision of the future. Uh, for me, I intend to be uh, quick to listen and slow to speak. I want to hear what their views are. As you know, um, my uh, tenure as health minister was in the first two and a half years of government, and then I served a short stint as interim health minister in, uh, in the past few months earlier this year. I've truly appreciated being able to work with health officials and uh, I'll look forward to continuing to do so in this role as we continue to deal with the pandemic. I have a great deal of respect for the many health officials that I've had the opportunity to work with both as health minister um, in my first uh, couple of years in government more recently uh, earlier this year and now continuing on. You will also know that the legislature is currently on recess. There are five bills that have been held over and they are scheduled for uh, a vote. There's also been hundreds of presenters uh, that have registered in our very unique process in Manitoba where the public can come and give presentation directly to uh, the lawmakers, to the legislators. That's a great, great process and I want to thank all of those individuals who signed up to have their voices heard on those five bills in particular. However, I also know that a new leader has to be able to set their own agenda. As such, Cabinet and Caucus have authorized with, authorized with my full support that those bills will not move forward this fall. However, there are some budgetary matters that need to be completed to ensure that programs and staff and government have the resources that they need. So we will enter, enter into discussions with the opposition parties to seek a brief legislative sitting this fall to both remove the five bills that were designated for a vote and then to pass the current provincial budgetary matters that need to be resolved. Again, I want to thank my colleagues for their confidence to serve in this role. Uh, it is no small thing to have the colleagues that you serve with select you to fulfill uh, a role as their leader. It is not the normal way that uh, one assumes this office. I recognize that, but it is still a great honour to be selected by those who I think know me best from a legislative side. Uh, to say that I'm the best person to fill this role at this time. I uh, want to assure Manitobans that I will work hard to ensure that we're moving safely through this difficult time with the goal of helping our province recover from a social, economic and equity perspective. And now it is my distinct honour, my first opportunity as the Premier to take the questions from my many colleagues in the media who I appreciate and respect. If there's a brief uh, fall sitting, um, and I know this will obviously go beyond the extent of your mandate, 
when do you foresee the legislature resuming under the new leader? When can people expect to see whether that new leader reintroduces the, some of the bills that might be withdrawn? So, I mean, this really is, uh, Steve, about setting that clean slate for, for a new leader. I mean, that's why it's important, I think, to remove these five bills. New leader will make their determination on, you know, throne speech timing, if that's, uh, if that's the first order of business, which it likely would be. Um, if, uh, depending on how the House uh, deals with the five bills, I th think there's a strong possibility that that'll be the first thing that'll, that'll happen. Uh, traditionally in our, in our legislature, that happens in the third week of uh, November and carries on into early December, but, um, you know, that is, uh, that's not set in stone, so a new leader would have input into that. So, I'm uh, sorry, a new leader will be leading when the, the, when the brief fall sitting takes effect? Uh, no. So, well, I don't believe so. I believe that the uh, brief fall sitting, uh, which, you know, could be uh, only a few days, uh, would be there to finish the budgetary uh, requirements. So the Budget Implementation and Tax Statute Amendment Act, there needs to be some uh, additional time for estimates on the current budget process. And then I think there's a Loan Appropriation Act that needs to be passed as well. That, that uh, doesn't take a tremendous amount of time because the budget itself has been uh, passed uh, and then the bills have to be withdrawn. So my expectation is that that would happen um, prior to October 30th. So would it resume October 6th as scheduled? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll have that discussion with um, uh, the House Leader of the NDP, uh, Nahani Fontaine, and the House Leader of the Liberals, John Gerard. Um, there's nothing that prevents us from coming back earlier. Uh, if we can get an agreement in terms of dealing with those matters, withdrawing the bills, uh, and, uh, and then going forward uh, from there. So there's, n there's nothing that says the legislature can't, by agreement, sit earlier or start on the regularly scheduled date or start later. What we do know for sure is that the uh, fall agenda will be significantly lighter because those five bills have been removed. Um, the uh, hundreds of presenters who are scheduled, and I do again thank them for, for registering, uh, that committee process won't go ahead, so there, there won't be a tremendous amount on the legislative agenda other than the budgetary provisions, which shouldn't take long but need to be passed. So I did communicate with um, uh, Nahani Fontaine yesterday that uh, she, she reached out and wish her, wished me uh, well and congratulations, I appreciated that. Uh, and I did indicate to her that I would be speaking uh, with her in the next couple of days to try to uh, figure out the best path forward for Manitobans on how the House will operate. Would it be that hydro rate hike in, in BITSA as it has been in the past? Yeah, so BITSA hasn't been um, introduced yet into the legislature, so I can't speak to the contents uh, of BITSA, but obviously, you know, one of the designated bills that won't be going forward is the uh, bill that deals with the PUB and rate setting over a longer period of time. Um, so that's impacted uh, for sure, but uh, I can't speak to uh, bits in its contents at this point. You have the authority through bits uh, to enact a one-year rate, correct? BITSA has broad authority uh, for a number of different budgetary matters. Uh, you know, I'm sure that it would be wise for me to defer some of this to the, uh, to the finance minister, but I do think that there are provisions within BITSA to, to do a number of different things when it comes to, um, to rates. I don't think there's there's a, a reason for it to now that the vast majority of the legislative agenda um, won't be there. Uh, there is a, you know additional hours that have to be done for estimates. Uh, for those who are watching, estimates is the process where we go line by line through the budgetary items and a lot of broad-based questions that happen about government expenditures. So. Um, you know, I could foresee a few days uh, of, of that process. I think that's important. It's, it's important for uh, the opposition to be able to uh, question rigorously government on its expenditures, uh, and then moving BITSA uh, and the loan appropriation uh, forward would be helpful. There are other mechanisms, uh, Tom, by which it could be done. There are backstops. There are dates that say that BITSA has to be passed by a certain day. I don't have it in front of me. I think it's about November 7th. So. There isn't a requirement to come back for you know four or five days to do that. I think it would be the right thing to do, though, to have uh, to have that fuller debate. Your two members of your own caucus aren't fully vaccinated, and you've got two other MLAs who are opposing the vaccination mandate in the public service. 
Your predecessor, Pallister, had said that that was uh, undermining the government, undermining cabinet, that's the role of the opposition. I'm wondering if you're going to have a caucus vote on whether to expel Mr. Teitzma and Gunter. So, uh, I mean, I won't speak to, to the health status of, of individual MLAs that I personally am not uh, aware of. I would say this when it comes to uh, MLAs and, um, and, and when they express views that are sometimes, uh, you know, counter to, to government. In, in our system of government, the Westminster, Westminster system of government, we have a unique opportunity as elected officials. We get to go into a caucus or into a cabinet and bring the views of our constituents to that place and to influence the decision that is made there. That very few people ever have that opportunity. That doesn't mean we always get the decision that we want or that we're advocating for. I've been here for 18 years and I've advocated for many things that uh, didn't become uh, policy. That's okay. That's the, that's the great part of our system is you bring different voices from around the province and have that advocacy. That's the best place for it. Uh, I believe that that those views uh, and, and MLA should bring the views of their constituents vigorously to that table. And I think the best results happen when they come to that table. So that's my encouragement. I've uh, spoken to my caucus colleagues about that, that uh, I think that that is the place for it. If there's been concerns in the past that for some reason they didn't feel that they had uh, the access to the Premier that, that they would have liked, uh, I've taken steps to uh, address that. That won't be that won't be a challenge. They can always come in and speak to me on a on a regular basis. But I believe that at that table is the best place for those discussions. Mr. Tyson compared residential schools to vaccine mandate. Is that acceptable to have Sorry, an MLA? I, I missed the first part because. Tom was aggressively getting in there. I'll go back to Tom, but... I mean, Mr. Teitzma was likening residential schools to vaccination mandates. Is it acceptable to you as Premier to have MLAs express that? Does that count as part of their free speech? Uh, my view uh, is that we are to be supportive of, of individuals getting vaccinated. Uh, I've encouraged uh, those in my family to get vaccinated. I was vaccinated relatively as early as I could by the qualifications. My, uh, my wife and my son uh, have been vaccinated. We'll continue to encourage that. I would encourage MLAs to, uh, to encourage their friends and their family to get vaccinated because the goals that, that all of us are striving for are to keep things open. Uh, when we talk about the desire to have freedoms, and often those who are concerned about the public health orders are speaking about freedoms. The end result of what I think is trying to be achieved, and lots of people don't always agree with uh, the mechanisms by which that happens, but the end result is to keep your schools open. The end result is to keep that small business open down the street. The end result is to keep your house of worship open if you are uh, participating in that and to ensure that the healthcare system doesn't get overrun. Those are the goals of these measures. So even if people don't disagree with, with the proposed measures, and I haven't always disagreed or agreed with everything, that's part of the process. Let's all focus on what we're trying to achieve. You talked about the Westminster model. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the traditions of the Westminster model also is that when you speak out against your own government that you get removed from caucus, especially on something as important as this, will those members be removed from caucus? Uh, so, of course, there's differences when a person is in the Executive Council as opposed to when they're not in the Executive Council. What I would say, Tom, is I have spoken to uh, the two MLAs. Uh, I've expressed my view that the best place for bringing concerns, and we all have concerns at different times about how things are being done, uh, is to my table, to the table of caucus. I think that they understand uh, that, and uh, and I think that I'll provide them greater opportunities to have that voice heard if they haven't before. So in the past, we've seen in the past that some party, that some party leaders, in a, when there's a sort of a leadership vacuum or a transition in leadership, we've seen in the past that in other parties, some backbenchers have felt so suddenly free to speak out and break ranks. Are you worried that given your interim status as, as party leader, that there will be less caucus discipline? I wouldn't describe it as caucus discipline as much as caucus unity. Uh, 
I think that there are always going to be differences that exist within a caucus. That isn't inherently bad. In fact, in many ways, that's inherently good. You get to better decision points when not everybody agrees at the table. I don't want, in my brief time as Premier, to have everybody agree with me at the table. I don't want to try to dominate a decision uh, because I have a particularly you know, strong opinion on something. That is not uh, how you get to a good decision. I want as many people to come to me with a variety of different opinions and strong opinions and to express that and then try to come to a collective decision that doesn't always satisfy everyone uh, at that table. I think I expressed that uh, to, to our caucus yesterday. I think there's an understanding of that. I hope that, yes, you're right. I'm only in this position for 60 days, and that brings with it a number of different unique challenges. Um, but I do hope that my time uh, in that caucus and as a legislator will bring a certain degree of, uh, of harmony because they know, I understand some of the challenges that, that people go through at different times, but the time and the place to bring those differences and challenges is to a caucus internally uh, or to the leader. And I had those discussions and I believe they understand that. Have you told them it's unacceptable to go public? I've said to uh, my caucus uh, colleagues that the best place to bring your ideas, your concerns, your views, your constituents' concerns, you should always be advocating for your constituents, is to the caucus or the cabinet table, depending on which position that you hold. I think that they, uh, they understand that. Um, we'll see in the, in the test of time if, if you feel that that message was a, uh, wasn't powerful or didn't resonate enough, but, but, I, but I got it from them that they understood that. But it's also incumbent upon me now as the leader. It's not enough for me to say, you have to bring uh, your views uh, to the caucus or, or to a cabinet table. I have to be, have an open door to listen to them. Uh, that's, that's a big part of leadership. And, and so I've made that commitment, demonstrated it, that I'm going to do that for my, my caucus colleagues. I want to hear their views, and I think we'll come to better decision making, and I think it will alleviate some of those challenges. So you want them all again? Uh, well, I'm not a golfer, uh, but I am somebody who uh, has been involved in politics a long time. And I think that the best way sometimes to deal with those challenges is to meet with individuals, to speak about why it is that they got to a certain place, and then try to address the reasons why they got to that place. That's what I did. Um, I think it was respected. I think we're going to be able to move forward as, as a, uh, a party with good unity and make sure that the next leader inherits that. That doesn't mean we will agree on everything. Um, but I do think that the best place for those discussions is at the cabinet and caucus table. Okay, there was like three different uh, calls in there. Uh, when you were education minister, you said you were looking forward to bringing those reforms forward. They were presented this year. They were very unpopular. Uh, could you get that sense from, from your caucus that there was interest in, in killing this bill? So, I mean, I, I haven't, been, haven't been the education minister for, uh, for several months. I think that there is a strong feeling across Manitoba that the education system in Manitoba uh, should be approved, uh, improved, sorry, and uh, that it should be strengthened. I think that there's a common understanding and a common belief among Manitobans about that. The mechanism is always a matter of debate. Um, I was the education minister when the K-12 commission uh, was presented by uh, Clayton Manis and uh, Janice uh, McInnes. And within that report were many good things. It talked about improving educational outcomes for our Aboriginal population. It talked about equity in education so that no matter where you were in Manitoba, that you could get the same quality as education as everyone else. Those are principles, I think, that are very much um, ascribed to by Manitobans. And, uh, and I think that many Manitobans will be looking uh, to ensure that those principles uh, are continued upon. Um, I do know that the Minister of Education, I understand, will speak to this issue a little bit further tomorrow. But uh, to the extent that um, you know, I heard uh, criticism, it was maybe that there was uh, a movement away too far from, uh, from the report as it was provided in, um, uh, two years ago.
the first, or maybe even the first, Mennonite premier. Uh, this is obviously a role that most Anabaptists don't go for, and you even yourself expressed that this wasn't a role that you were eyeing. Uh, for you, what does this signal being a Mennonite in such a strong leadership position when many Mennonites in Manitoba uh, continue, especially throughout this pandemic, to have strong distrust in the government? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question that probably has many layers to it. Um, when I indicated that I wouldn't be seeking um, the role of Premier, I didn't expect to be sitting here in the role as Premier uh, not long after. Uh, that was mostly a personal decision. Um, I think that if you're going to take on a leadership role, you have to be willing to commit to it for a decade. Now, the electorate makes its own decisions, but I think you should go into it with the idea that you'll commit to it for a decade. You know, speaking with my wife and, and uh, my son, who's uh, of the age now to bring input into those decisions, um, that would have been a difficult commitment uh, for us to make. Uh, from a Mennonite perspective, and uh, I'm not a practicing Mennonite by faith, but I understand sort of the cultural connection, um, that there's often that feeling that, you know, you shouldn't be involved in, in things uh, in the world. I think that, you know, the Mennonite population has, uh, over more than 100 years in Manitoba, uh, done great things in the province of Manitoba and been well respected. So I do think that I, mean, I would encourage uh, those who have leadership aspirations in the Mennonite community uh, to, to be leaders in the community as they have been for the last 100 years. Uh, to the extent that, uh, you know, you see hesitancy on certain issues when it comes to certain populations, um, I, I think that we need to continue to have that dialogue and to, to try to understand better why that is. Uh, I've learned uh, in my time, and I maybe didn't always understand this as well when I was young, that the, the loudest voice isn't always the strongest voice, uh, and it's often better to listen for a while. Um, before trying to figure out a solution. So I spent a lot of time listening and talking to friends um, and, and neighbors who don't agree uh, in the same way that I do uh, and in trying to you know, convince them of my view, but in a respectful way. It should always be done respectfully. One of my great concerns right now taking this role is there's a lots of division in Manitoba, lots of people who, who fundamentally uh, uh, not just disagree with each other, which isn't a bad thing, um, but there's becoming animosity between people and between communities, and that worries me. It's the animosity that worries me as much as anything. So I'm proud as a, someone with Mer uh, Mennonite roots coming from uh, a Mennonite community to be able to take on uh, this role. I hope that the community is, is proud of me too and that they will be at the end of, of 60 days, um, but ultimately uh, it doesn't matter regardless of your... Uh, of your uh, ethnicity uh, or your beliefs, I want to represent all Manitobans for the next uh, time that I'm in this office. Mr. 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 Prager, we have some reporters on the line that would like to ask some questions first as well. Thank you, Premier Gertsen. A reminder to our reporters on the line, you have one preliminary and one follow-up question. Up first this afternoon from the Brandon Sun, Kyle. Good afternoon, Premier. Um, during the committee hearings that were scheduled for the fall, there were around 400 to 500 people registered to speak on Bill 64. Now that that bill has been uh, moved into the future, will these people still get an opportunity to speak on the bill uh, at some point in the future? So um, I have no expectation that that bill uh, will ever return in the future. The um, the bill will not proceed, whether the House prorogues or whether it's withdrawn. Um, by unanimous consent, the mechanism by which it, it uh, um, is not going forward will be determined through negotiation, but it will not exist uh, after, um, after we're done with this uh, fall sitting. So the, the 500 presenters um, won't be scheduled to be presenting on anything because there'll be nothing to present on. Um, but I do appreciate that they that they registered and that they were willing to come to the legislature either in person or virtually to to speak about education and the importance of of education and making it better. So I'm grateful for them uh, and for the fact that they did register, but there won't be presentations because there won't be anything to present on. Okay, so just to clarify again, so is, at this point is bill sixty four the Education Modernization Act is it basically dead? 
Uh, it will be once the House uh, returns and uh, we go through the process of either uh, withdrawing or proguing the House, depending what the mechanism is through negotiation. From CBC Radio Canada, Chantalia. Um, good afternoon. I have a question. Is, uh, do you have any plan ready in case there is a fourth, uh, uh, the fourth uh, wave of COVID-19 coming up? So, as you know, I mean, those plans are, are led by, um, by public health. Um, I've been engaged with public health uh, a lot in a lot of different roles, uh, not just over the last 18 months, but, but previous to that as well. They are always planning and they're always running scenarios and they're always running projections uh, about uh, where things go. Um, I believe we've taken a proactive approach um, in, in trying to deal with the with the fourth wave and the Delta variant. And so obviously we are uh, of the belief that being proactive will help to blunt the uh, fourth wave and ultimately achieve the goals of keeping our businesses open, our healthcare system from being overwhelmed, keeping our kids in school and allowing people to go to houses of worship. That is the goal of all of this, to allow people to continue to do the things that they missed last fall. Um, and what are your priorities for the next two months now you were in a church? Yeah, you know, so it, if I had to, you know, sum it up, and I, I think I tried to describe some of that this um, earlier in my comments, um, I want to reach out to a lot of groups and, and, and speak to a lot of people to open the Premier's office, to, to listen to them, to be able to provide to the incoming uh, leader in 60 days a bit of a summary of the things that I've heard from hopefully uh, dozens if not hundreds of groups over that uh, over that time. I started that today by speaking to uh, Grand Chief Dumas, uh, the president of AMM, I'll speak to Brian Bowman later this afternoon, uh, spoke to Wab Canoe. Um, I believe that, you know, the, the political system um, is competitive there are strong ideas, so whether it's political parties or entities rep representing other groups. I'm going to reach out to union leaders. Um, you know, I'll be reaching out, obviously, to, to business leaders. Um, I want to hear from as many people as possible, invite them into the Premier's office and listen to their concerns. That's my primary goal uh, over the next 60 days uh, in terms of trying to ensure that I'm hearing from as many people as possible and bringing those views to a new leader in addition to, of course, the day-to-day -day things that, that happen in the Premier's office and key among those is, is uh, the current pandemic we're in and other things that are unforeseen. But I want to be, uh, be a listening ear. I want to bring forward those ideas to, to the new Premier open up the Premier's office for, for people uh, to come in. It is as much their office as it is mine uh, as Manitobans. From CTV Winnipeg, Jeff. Uh, hello, Mr. Premier. Um, on Bill 64, you said that there was criticism that the bill moved uh, far away from maybe that review. I'm, I'm wondering if you feel that way. Uh, so I said that, 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 that I had heard that criticism that had moved uh, too far away from it. So um, I think that any time individuals express uh, a strong view, uh, that you should listen to it and you should evaluate it. So I think that there'll be that time for evaluation. I know the Minister of Education will speak to that. Um, but it is an opportunity to be able to look at those things uh, within the K-12 Commission, which people generally felt were uh, important and were valuable, uh, and to look at how you know, those things uh, can, be, uh, can be implemented uh, at some point down the road if a new leader chooses to do so. But I would leave that to the new leader to do that. Obviously, the governance part was the part that got the most uh, attention. I understand that. Um, but I do think it unfortunately came at the expense of a lot of other things in the commission that uh, the Manitoba Teachers Society and the Manitoba School Boards Association thought were important and, uh, and were valuable. So maybe it's an opportunity uh, to refocus on those things where there's uh, greater unity on and then continue the discussion and listening. And I, want, I do want to say this, though. I know that 
Uh, Minister Cullen uh, has really, really engaged in a listening process and has been dedicated to, to listening uh, to people and is continuing uh, to listen. So I have great confidence uh, in him, in his ability, and his desire to hear from Manitobans on bettering the education system. But again, it will be a clean slate for a new leader to make some of those determinations. Why didn't you run for the PC leadership? Well, you didn't ask me to, Jeff, so I decided not to. Um, no, I, again, I think you have to um, look at where you are in, in your life. Uh, I think you have to look at where your family's at. I think there are two primary considerations. I spoke about this a little bit at the beginning. Uh, my father died when I was 11. Um, I have one son. I probably, some would say, would be a bit of a doting father. Uh, but it's really, really important to me that I'm there for him at every stage uh, of his life. Uh, and that, to me, is the most important role that I could have, that of being uh, a good dad and, and a, good, uh, a good husband. Uh, being a minister in a crown, it's nice. Being premier, I'm honored. Uh, but those aren't the key roles that, that I aspire to. And in, in speaking with my family, I, uh, I, I, it wasn't a hard decision. I, I absolutely feel it was the right decision for me. We now return to the News Conference Theatre. What are your long-term uh, plans? Do you plan to stay on after your two months as Premier? Do you plan to stay on till the end of your term or run for another term? I know we're looking down the road and you just stepped into the Premier. It's my office. first day and you wonder yeah. if I'm going to leave uh, in 60 days, you know. Boy, this is tough. <laughs> it's a tough crowd. Um, you know, my wife and I would normally look at, um, at elections uh, a year before they're scheduled to be called. And that's been the case since, since we were elected back in uh, 2003. So my son wasn't born yet at that, at that point, and so the dynamics changed a little bit. But uh, generally, we sort of wait about a year out from an election, then make a determination. I'm really excited about, about uh, the party, the future. I think, you know, I know this is a challenging time for, for our party and, and for our government, and I'm not dismissing that. And we have lots of work to do. Uh, and we need to do more listening, and we need to do more outreach. Uh, and I think that that is what our party is committed to do. And I look forward to being a part of that, certainly now. Uh, but absolutely, uh, I, I am personally very interested in, in running again in another election if, uh, if the people of my constituency uh, would have me. But uh, that is a decision ultimately my wife and I would make when we're about a year before the election. Manitoba was hit hard by the second and third waves of the COVID-19 pandemic. And in some cases, the, the physicians issued warnings that were not listened to. With the fourth wave coming and with kids going back to school during your time in office, what, what do you plan to do differently to make sure that the fourth wave is not as severe? Well, I think we have been proactive. And I did speak with Dr. Rusin uh, this morning, and, and I think that uh, uh, it would be fair to say that he described it uh, that way as well, that we are being proactive at the point that we're at. When you look at the case counts and hospitalizations uh, to the west of us, primarily in, in, in provinces, Saskatchewan, Alberta, where the numbers uh, are going up. Uh, you look at the measures that we've put in place in advance of numbers getting to that place. Uh, I think that uh, we've taken a proactive approach and it's all with the same goal. We want to keep our businesses open. We want to keep our houses of worship open. We want to keep schools open. We want to keep the healthcare system from being overwhelmed so people can get surgeries when they need it. It's not just about COVID. There are thousands of surgeries that get canceled when uh, we get over a certain ICU capacity. So um, I think that we've taken proactive measures and certainly in comparison to, to other provinces, but obviously as public health brings forward uh, advice, uh, we'll take that into consideration. And there was no media notice about your swearing in today, and we couldn't even send a photographer. So should the press be worried about media access during your term as Premier, or was that a mistake? Well, I think I've been here for now about half an hour. It feels a bit longer than that, uh, but and I'm happy to stay uh, uh, a bit longer as well. No, you know, and, I, and I'll be honest. I mean, I, I struggled with that a little bit about the way in which the swearing in should happen. I, I recognize that this is unique to Manitoba. Um, I'm not putting myself out there as, as, as somebody who's been, you know, elected by the broader party, which is the normal 
uh, sort of way this would normally transpire, or somebody who's gone through a general election, which is another another way. I recognize this is a unique circumstance. I've been selected by my caucus to serve in the role, and that is how it works in the Westminster model uh, of parliament. But it is still different, and and I don't want to um, uh, you know pretend that it isn't uh, different. So I made the decision that it should be just a small private ceremony uh, only with my family. My mom was there, uh, my stepfather, my sister, my niece, uh, and my, and my mother-in-law, uh, and of course my wife and, and my son. Uh, we decided to do it uh, private uh, in that way because of these unique circumstances. I think there were probably pros and cons to doing it uh, both ways. Um, I, I think that the real way, the, the, the right way to do it uh, the most humble way to do it was was that way, recognizing it's a unique circumstance. If others feel differently and, and, and feel that, you know, it should have been a grander sort of uh, ceremony, uh, it wasn't for uh, uh, for not wanting to speak to the media. I love speaking to the media. Every day if I can speak to the no, I'm kidding. I actually don't mind speaking to the media. I've done this for 18 years and, I, and, and I've said this before. Uh, we are flip sides of the same coin. Your job is important in holding us accountable. I don't always like all the questions. I don't always like how every article turns out or how every news report, report turns out, but I've always respected the job that you do. You are an important part of keeping this democracy going. And, and so while I might not always agree with everything, I'm not trying to hide from you. And uh, from your Pride Winnipeg is coming up this weekend, what is your message to LGBT Manitobans? Well, certainly I think that all Manitobans uh, you know, have the opportunity to, to celebrate. Uh, their uniqueness and to celebrate um, their uh, pride that they have in themselves. Uh, and so I'm a premier for all Manitobans and I will represent all Manitobans. Um, I've had the opportunity to uh, attend uh, different uh, events, whether they were um, events specific about learning. Uh, as the health minister, I often met with those in the LGBTQ community, particularly around individual health concerns and considerations, uh, because as the health minister, I acted for all Manitobans, uh, and that's my role. What are you going to do about vaccine hesitancy, uh, Premier? In, in, including yeah. in your writing in Steinbeck, there were hundreds of people out. Uh, and those are some of your constituents, some of the people who would have voted for you. What will you do to address this problem? You know, it's it's an excellent question, Ian, and not one with an easy answer. Um, I think we have to be careful sometimes that we don't turn vaccine hesitancy into vaccine hostility. And and that means, you know, how we approach it um, can't be simply by, uh, you know, shouting at somebody or going onto Facebook and, and getting into an argument. Nobody that I know in my life has ever changed their mind by a Facebook argument. I've seen a lot of friendships break up by that. Um, so where I've seen an impact when it comes to vaccine hesitancy in my community, it's individuals speaking to individuals and, and, and community leaders. And I've tried to, to do my best in terms of you know, speaking about why I got vaccinated um, and friends and neighbors talking to each other, those who are maybe in the same sports team or they work together. I've heard of co-workers being able to convince other co-workers to get the vaccine. But we also are going to have to realize that we're not going to get 100% vaccination. Uh, and that also means that we're going to have to have other strategies. And so I think that the required testing program that we have um, is, um, is a reality that's uh, you know, been put in place by, by public health, that if you do not get a vaccine in certain areas, that you are required to take a test. That is an accommodation to the fact and the reality that we will not reach 100% vaccination rate, and we have to understand that. So I will continue as best as I can to encourage people to get vaccinated. I think we have to do it in a way that isn't shaming and pitting communities against each other and calling each other names. I don't think that's going to change hesitancy. I think that's going to create hostility. Um, it is going to be individuals to individuals, uh, I think primarily as we get into the later stages of this, and then recognizing not everyone is going to get vaccinated, uh, and we have to still have people part of the society. So having uh, testing is a possibility, 
um, that's already been implemented, uh, and, and I think that we'll have to continue to look at those methods. Do you support the current vaccine mandate? Sorry? It, do you support the, the government's rules in terms of mandatory vaccination to enter certain areas? Do you support that as it stands? Yeah, and so, I mean, we have uh, we have sort of two elements, right, of, of where we're going at right now. We have, when it comes to certain workplaces, there, uh, it's not mandatory vaccination. It's required testing, though, if you're not if you're not vaccinated. I think that that is a reasonable accommodation because there are unintended consequences sometimes uh, if you uh, if you don't have that accommodation. And there can be you can create other health crises uh, as well if you're not sort of reasonable about that. In terms of what's been you know happening in terms of you can't go to a bomber game, and some of you might know I go to a few bomber games unless you've had uh, uh, the vaccine. I mean, we've seen other provinces following that because they see that as a way that we can keep things open. So there will be people who disagree with that. There'll be people uh, in my circle of friends, and I've heard from them, who, who disagree with that. Um, I can tell you, I mean, I, you know, I worked uh, and had lots of conversations with the bombers leading up to, to the season. Um, in my role as Deputy Premier about how we could get fans back into the stands and how we could do it safely. Um, I think that other provinces and now other jurisdictions in the United States, some NFL teams and NHL teams are following Manitoba's lead because, not because anybody wants it that way, not because anybody thinks that's the optimal situation. None of us think it's, it's how we want to lead our lives. Nobody wants to have that differentiation. But if we're going to be able to, at this stage of the pandemic, keep things open, keep the bombers uh, playing, keep our houses of worship open, keep our businesses open, there are going to be some things that not everybody's going to like that we're going to have to do for this period of time. The end goal, though, is to keep as much open and operating as possible because that's important to people. It's important to their mental health. You know, I, I mean, I don't overstate it uh, because... I don't overstate it. I, I, was, I was able to attend the Great Cup a couple of years ago uh, with my wife and son in Calgary, and uh, it was an emotional time for us, actually, really, you know, long years between winning Great Cups. Uh, and then wondering if we'd ever see another Bomber game again, be able to go back into the stadium that first game. It wasn't just me. There's a lot of people who, who were emotional with that, and I know that's small in the grand scheme of things. That's really small in terms of what's going on in life and society right now. But for a lot of people, those small things matter. And if we can keep those as much open as possible, and if that requires for this short period of time that uh, proof of uh, a vaccination, then uh, for a short period of time, I think it's what's necessary. Do you think it's important to have a target for vaccinations? In, in other words, a certain percentage of, of uh, the population being vaccinated? Um, a lot of people are, are wondering where that number is. Uh, we're taking all these measures. Uh, they're temporary, hopefully, uh, in terms of vaccine mandates and in terms of public health orders. What's the end game? Uh, and the, the most frequent question that comes up these days is where do we have to get to? What percentage of people have to be vaccinated, fully vaccinated? Uh, and in your discussions with Dr. Rusin, yeah. is there a number? And is it, will we hear a number soon? Yeah, I know, I know they're working on on those you know numbers um, because it's changed right with the with the delta variant i think if we hadn't had the delta variant we'd be in a much much different place i mean our vaccination numbers are actually quite good i commend manitobans i i don't know the doctors and ever would have thought we'd get to this level of a vaccination you know when we started this and and had he thought we'd get to this level of vaccination and the variant the delta variant hadn't come along i think he would have thought we'd be in a much different place than, uh, than we're potentially facing right now. So I think it is important for, you know, for public health to, to have those targets. I think the challenge though, Tom, is that people get frustrated because they see things moving and, and that causes distrust sometimes too. So they hear about, well, we should get to 75%. Oh no, 80%, 85%. And it causes them to look and they go, well, you know, is there mistrust in, in government? Do they really know what they're doing and the reality is that i mean this is a little bit how science works they're learning and we're learning as we go along and then things adjust but i understand the frustration that people would have i get the frustrated by that too sometimes i mean i'm living this as well and and i want for my family and for other families and my neighbors and my friends for this to end and so people get frustrated because the targets change and so yes i think that that internally certainly uh, i'll be encouraging public health to continue to to produce that data i'd like to see it 
Um, but I understand why people get frustrated when they hear different targets because sometimes they move. But I want them to know it's not because um, there's you know some mistrust that they should feel about about public health or that um, there's a lack of an ability uh, to do things. The circumstances have changed and so the targets have to change with it. As hard and as frustrating as that is for all of us, and I totally understand that. I, you know, I'd have to hear from public health. I, I don't know exactly where they are on that. I haven't had a briefing on, on where they are uh, on targets. I do know that they're working out, you know, calculations all the time. What do you say to the protesters that are gathering in, in some communities? These protests are getting bigger and they're getting louder. What do you say to them? You know, I, I say to those who are concerned about, you know, how uh, public health is, is making recommendations, um, that they may not agree with, with um, and clearly they don't if they're protesting, with the recommendations. And it sort of goes back to some of the earlier questions. I, I understand that. Not everybody is going to agree on everything. I, I hope that they could at least agree upon what the goals are. The goals are that we don't have to shut down, shut down your church or your synagogue or your mosque or your temple this fall like is what happened last year. That's hard on people's mental health. The goal is to keep those small businesses open. The goal is clearly not to overwhelm the healthcare system but to make sure your kids stay in school. My son was out of school for um, uh, six weeks last year before Christmas. It was really hard on him. I know how hard that is. I also know it's not easy sometimes to sit in class and wear a mask or to sit in a meeting and wear a mask. I understand that too. That it's, it, it's frustrating. We all want this to end. But the goal of it is to keep these things open. So even if you don't agree with the mechanism of it, please look towards the goal of what we're trying to do, and that is to keep these things that you love and that you value open and that we all want open. I think the issue some people might take with that, Premier, is that they believe the businesses, synagogues, churches could remain open without these measures. So what do you say to that? Well, I think that, you know, the evidence we have uh, doesn't prove that out. Um, there's been, uh, and public health has demonstrated, you know, lots of different challenges where there's been uh, gatherings in certain environments where there haven't been, um, where there haven't been measures put in place. So, you know, you have to follow sort of the evidence in this and the evidence of where it goes. We recognize um, after the, uh, the last wave, I mean, we had a significant health crisis in, uh, in Manitoba at that time. We were moving people out of province to go to ICU. Um, that is significant. And that focus was obviously on the people who were being moved out of ICU. And I understand why the focus was there and it should be on there. But there were, there were tens of thousands of surgeries that had to be canceled because they were moving nurses from the, um, from the main medical wards and surgical wards into the ICU units. And so it wasn't just impacting people who had COVID or who had you know, go to an ICU, it was impacting everybody. If you had a family member who needed a, a hip replacement or a cataract, I mean, all of these different things were somehow, you know, directly or indirectly impacted. So uh, that is the evidence that if there is um, an outbreak that is uncontrolled, in Manitoba, that it impacts ultimately the healthcare system, that it impacts the ICU system, and that it goes far beyond that in the healthcare system, impacts thousands of other Manitobans. So we need to prevent that from happening, but we need to do it with, with some balance as well. And so the ability now, the game changer, of course, is we do have vaccines and we do have proof of, of vaccination, so we can use that to keep things open. Uh, we can use that to ensure that we have large gatherings. There's many people, and you know, I won't speak for, for the bombers, but in some of the discussions, I think we didn't know if we'd be able to have 10 or 15,000 people at a, at a football game in the summer. And now they can have 30,000 if they're fully vaccinated. So the game has changed. We're in a better place in terms of the tools that we have to be able to use to keep those, those houses of faith and those, those businesses open everybody's not going to agree on the mechanism. I've given up on trying to make everybody agree. Uh, and, and I've gotten many messages of people who will frankly never be my friend again. And, and that's hard. But we have to make the right decisions to keep these things open in the fall. So we have time for one more question.
with vaccines available, Premier, uh, you say it's the best tool. Public health officials agree. Given your new role and your status as a long-standing Southern MLA, is there an opportunity in the next eight weeks before any potential fourth wave to bump up vaccine uptake in some of those areas where it's really lagging behind? Yeah, and I hope so. And I mean, I know that there's a lot of individual and sort of micro-targeting that, that's going on. It's really about that community member talking to a community member and friend talking to friend because we're at that sort of uh, uh, at that rate. Um, you know, in, in the city that I represent, the city of Steinbach, I think I do check it almost every day. I think yesterday the vaccination rate was about 61 and a half percent. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of, of a lot of work to continue to encourage people. I do it individually. I know other MLAs, um, you know, are doing that as well in the areas they represent. So, you know, I think there are opportunities to try to uh, to get those rates higher. But I really think it's not going to be by yelling at people. It's not going to be by calling people names. It's not going to be by going on Facebook or trying to shame somebody or pitting one community against another. This cannot be a Winnipeg versus a Southern community thing. Uh, at the end of the day, we're, we're all Manitobans, so we need to treat each other respectfully, even if we disagree. So this brings me, this brings me round circle to, uh, uh, to Steve's question. Caucuses don't always agree. Members of the legislature don't always agree. Members of the public don't always agree. After 18 months, I've just accepted that. I've accepted that there will be some people who will never agree with me. What I won't accept, though, is as Manitobans, we can't find a different way to disagree than by yelling at each other and screaming at each other. Let's talk to each other. Let's hear what each other have to say. Um, and what I would say to Manitobans, I'll encourage them to do is get vaccinated, get vaccinated for your community, get vaccinated for your friends and family. If you do, you're going to help us keep businesses open, keep your churches open, keep your schools open, and not have the healthcare system overwhelmed. Much of that, much of that is, is fueled by misinformation. Is there anything more a government can do to address that? It is fueled by misinformation, uh, a lot of it, and and I don't know. I mean, government perhaps could you know could look at ways to more quickly address things as they come out. I know that uh, you know whether people say that vaccines are harmful for for, for certain things or or that uh, you know ingredients in the vaccines. I think that to, to some extent, our health folks have tried to do that quickly. Uh, maybe uh, maybe we can do that better, and the, and there's a quicker way to to communicate. Um, but you know that we live in a world of social media these days, and by the time I've, I've said anything, somebody can misconstrue it a thousand different ways. Not that you would do that, Tom, but, uh, but others might, and, and that's just the world that we live in. Thank you again uh, to all of you here and those of you on the line. Again, I want to say it's a unique opportunity for me. I'm very honored. Um, I know there'll be times when over these 60 days where you'll have tough and challenging questions. I respect that. I, I, I know that's your role. Uh, as um, as reporters uh, in the 18 years that I've been here, uh, um, I've never always agreed with everything, but I have always respected uh, Manitoba's media and the way you approach things. So thank you very much.